Hi, welcome to the Yale School of Management MBA for Executives program with our webinar featuring the Commonwealth Fund Fellowship. Um, my name is Maria Statsmani Marquez and I serve as the Associate Director of Admissions. And in the next 45 minutes, our aim is to share with you more about the Commonwealth Fellowship Fund in Minority Health Leadership, as well as provide you with an overview of the curriculum, the program structure, and maybe some next steps regarding admissions. Um, so I I'm really excited to introduce two of my colleagues, Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith and Dr. Howard Foreman, also Howie. Thank you so much for being here. I want to spend Thank a couple you. of minutes doing an inter like introduction, if yeah. that's OK. Thank you. OK. Um, so Dr. Uh, Nunez-Smith, um, really, she serves as the director of the Commonwealth Fund Fellowship in Minority Health Leadership. And she also has two appointments as professor, associate professor both at the Yale School of Medicine, also the Yale School of Management. Um, additionally, she serves across Yale um, in a couple of directorships, one at the Yale Equity Research um, and Innovation Center, and then also the Center for Research Engagement. So I'm going to be excited to hear more about those. Um, also, she serves as core faculty for the National Clinician Scholars Program and is deputy director of the Yale Center for Clinical Investigation. Also, I guess in your spare time, <laughs> you're an attending physician at Yale New Haven Hospital. <laughs> so really excited that you're Thank here to you, speak Maria. about this. Yeah. And Dr. Howard Foreman, Howie, um, he has been here since the inception of the MBA for Executives program. Um, he serves not only as the co-founder, but also as the faculty director. And he has several appointments across Yale as well. This is the Yale School of Public Health, the Yale School of Medicine, Yale School of Management, Yale College. Am I missing any? <laughs> is that <laughs> OK? Um, he will, um, he's also the, co -found, the founder of the MBA MD program, um, which is a great joint degree here for at Yale School of Medicine and Yale School of Management. Um, and additionally, you're also a practicing radiology at Yale New Haven Hospital and will serve as a special advisor to the Commonwealth Fund Fellowship. So thank you both for taking some time out of your very busy days to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Well, to kick it off, um, we're going to talk a little bit about the mission at the Yale School of Management. So this, our mission is to educate leaders for business and society. And so how that translates into our students, our staff, our faculty, and our alumni. It's really about the broader mission of how can we impact change in a positive way so that our organizations are then serving for the greater good across society, um, locally and even more globally. So this is a really, um, we're very lucky to have so many alumni who are working in both the public and the private and the nonprofit sectors. And I think for those of you who are watching today, um, I think this will be really an, a, some strong alignment with the work that you do in healthcare. So we're really proud to be a part of Yale University. This is a beautiful photo across campus. Um, Yale is quite old. It is 300 years old, and it is home to many um, world-renowned doctors and lawyers and artists and scholars, as well as five presidents and 20 Nobel Peace Prize winners, one of which was recently named William Nordhaus, who is a Yale economist, um, was recently granted that this, this October. So while Yale University is quite old, Yale School of Management is very new. Um, we were founded in the mid-1970s with a really unique and novel mission. And I think that's really translated into the way in which we work and teach a business school education um, and have reimagined it over the last six years. I believe it's changed. Um, so I'm excited to share more about that with you and, and how this curriculum is broken down. Um, what you're looking at now is Evans Hall. This is our new building. It was uh, opened in 2014, and we're sitting inside one of the classrooms uh, within it. So, yeah. um, I'm going to switch gears here and talk about the Commonwealth Fund now. So this is really um, our inaugural year, yeah. and it's very exciting. The Commonwealth Fund itself was started, and I'm going to read because I don't want to um, make error in this. Um, it was among one of the first private foundations um, that was started by a woman philanthropist, Anna Harkness. And it was established in 1918, which now we're in our 100th year. And you know, it started with a grant of 10 million, which I think is about 151 million today. Um, but the idea was to really serve the welfare of all mankind. So with that, um, the mission itself, this is one of its mottos, is affordable health, affordable quality health care for everyone. Um, but the actual mission states, 
that the Commonwealth Fund is to promote high-performing healthcare systems that achieve better access, improved quality, greater efficiency, particularly for society's most vulnerable, including low-income populations, the uninsured, and people of color. Mm -hmm. So we feel very, very much aligned in missions here. Um, and because we shared a sense of place in the other two slides with Yale and Yale SOM, I wanted to share a sense of place for the Commonwealth. This is the Harkness building. It's located on East 75th in New York. And you know, it's really the Harkness family themselves have had philanthropic efforts throughout. And they were really mandated to create something that was actually going to benefit everyone. So with that mission and the alignment in mind, uh, Dr. Nunez-Smith, I wanted to ask you the question, um, can you tell us why minority health is so important today and even more than ever? Mm -hmm. So thank you, Maria, so mm -hmm. much. It's wonderful to be here in conversation with you and Howie today. We are extremely excited um, and enthusiastic about launching this fellowship program, and we're very grateful to Commonwealth Fund um, for funding it. And, and only to sort of piggyback on what you just said, the, uh, the commitment on behalf of Commonwealth Fund, as you so clearly articulated, has been longstanding when we think about minority health. Um, and they have chosen to invest in many programs mm -hmm. um, that are complementary in terms of uh, making sure that we are uh, educating um, and providing a skill set to the next generation of leaders, particularly those who are um, clinicians and are mm -hmm. um, in healthcare professions. Uh, so your question, I think, is a very poignant one, right? Why minority health now uh, more than ever? And, and certainly if you think about um, some of the, the two book and anchors where conversations around health equity uh, tend to, to begin, thinking about access and quality um, of care. And, uh, and to be frank, both of those um, are in jeopardy now. I mean, we've, great, we've made great strides, I think, looking over um, past decades in terms of access and in terms of quality. Uh, but there are many policy considerations now and discussions and debates now that um, do, in fact, threaten curtailing some of the progress we've, we've made. Um, and so whether you think about um, specific domains such as heart health um, or you think about um, infant mortality rates, I mean, across the full spectrum, uh, we still observe uh, persistent health inequities, health care inequities. Um, this program will most certainly, um, building on all the strengths here at the School of Management, provide already established uh, leaders with additional skills that whatever their domain of interest um, within healthcare, um, even sort of beyond, because we do say, you know, it's health in all places, um, uh, to be able to advance an agenda that can continue to um, make strides, mm -hmm. really, in terms of access quality and so much more. Yeah. Um, this is, I mean, I think that in listening to you just speak to that, I, there are so many places and so many people who are interested in the Commonwealth Fund who are doing this work yes. kind of at this nexus. Yes. And it's really interesting to hear their stories and why they've been interested. So I want to ask maybe a more personal story. Like, what inspired you to get into this area because you serve um, at the Center for Equity and, Innova and Innovation right. Center. Right. And so right. I'm really curious to hear yeah. what inspired you. My personal. Mm -hmm. um, so it's true. I, I very much strongly identify as a health equity researcher. I'm um, you know, trained as an internist. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then was fortunate to have an opportunity to come to Yale. Howie was one of my faculty members um, as a fellow in, in what was then the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation Clinical Scholars Program. Um, and most certainly I've had the, the great success to have numerous mentors along the way, um, including Howie, mm -hmm. who have said it's really important for those of us who are um, who are clinicians to be thinking, you know, even beyond our individual patients and how do we affect uh, the long term trajectories for the better of populations. Um, and so I most certainly um, would hearken back to having in people mm -hmm. like Howie um, incre like incredibly, incredibly strong mentors who've been able to um, role model uh, having these different hats and responsibilities. I mean, um, people who've heard me talk about this before know my own personal story um, was that I grew up in the uh, U.S. territory. Um, I grew up in St. Thomas in the U.S. Virgin Islands, uh, which uh, was 
designated as an underserved area, um, a healthcare uh, shortage area, and um, it really shaped me. Um, most certainly, uh, having family members and loved ones whose life was cut all too short um, because of chronic disease and, and essentially, you know, healthcare, uh, healthcare needs. So I very much knew that entering into the profession of medicine, that I was looking always for opportunities to think about individual patients and communities and populations. Mm -hmm. And I, I get to do that every day. So I count myself among the very lucky who um, go to work and um, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really feel like work right. um, <laughs> because it so much aligns mm -hmm. with all of my personal values and, and work and mission. And the colleagues are extraordinary. Thank you so much. I always love hearing about those stories because it is really what creates the purpose and meaning in all the things yes. that we're doing and what we're working to provide through this. Company. Yes, thank you for allowing me to share. Yeah. Um, so as we look forward, um, you know, how does this program itself actually, you know, address um, leadership training specifically in this area? And maybe I can start with you, Howie, and then we'll kind of yeah. toggle back and forth. Sure. Um, so one of the things we've recognized in the first. Uh, you know, 15 years, 13 years of the executive MBA program uh, is the fact that we can have a significant impact on, on young clinicians, on mid-career clinicians and late career, uh, career clinicians. Uh, and in fact, when we started the program, we always wondered, like, what is our impact on somebody who's 60 versus somebody who's 25 or 27? Um, and what we've seen is we've, we've been able to have a meaningful impact across the spectrum. Uh, but clearly those that are already out and practicing and already experiencing the challenges to their own careers as well as to being able to implement and deliver on the promises that they may have about you know, better uh, care, better access, lower cost, those challenges are not met by medical school education or residency education, those are, and, and quite frankly not met by public health education in general, uh, but can very well be met by by a program such as ours, the School of Management's uh, curriculum. I went to a different business school and I, I felt it was incredibly impactful to me in being able to implement change. Um, everybody takes those skills differently and different people sort of actualize in their own direction. Some people, I think, aspire to the highest levels of health, health system management and healthcare management. And I think that's great and we want to encourage people to be as aspirational as possible. But there's also an enormous impact in being a uh, clinical leader within a field, being a national clinical leader, even if you're not within your health system at the top of the pyramid, but being at the top of the pyramid in terms of national policy making. Um, and so we've been very fortunate. We've graduated, I imagine, well over 150 physicians at this point, and we've been very fortunate to see great outcomes in that group. The one thing that we have recognized, I think, is that we don't do as well with certain groups. Uh, we don't do as well with government workers, for instance, because they tend not to have as high salaries. They may not have be in the position to take the time. So we haven't done as well with that group. And we also haven't done as well with people that are sort of in more socially purposeful professions, no offense to others, also because their compensation tends to be lower. Um, and so we have, through our scholarships and through other means, I think tried to um, class build and make sure we have uh, the appropriate mix. But the Commonwealth Fund you know, takes us up a notch several levels and, and really allows us to deliver on the promises that we've made. Yeah, thank you. Thank you both. So we're getting into some structure here. Um, so with that, in terms of the themes and what you can expect, with this um, combination and this partnership with the Commonwealth Fund, um, we're going to go over kind of a broad overview of the curriculum structure. Um, so really, this is your full two years. Uh, we start with 75% of this being the integrated core curriculum, some advanced management courses which are designed for senior executives, and the leadership development. Um, as you can see, the leadership development spans across the two years. Um, and then the other 25% of the curriculum is meant to be within the health leadership practice. So you'll see that you'll be able to have access to some of the amazing colloquium speakers that Dr. Foreman brings in, and also the healthcare leadership component. That curriculum is six classes, and we'll go into the details there, um, as well as a practicum, which will I, I, well, you have the most information about that, so I'm gonna, I'd like to learn more about that as well. Um, but this is really the structure. Um, so this is what to expect just in terms of a broad overview. 
Um, one of the unique and innovative ways in which Yale School of Management delivers its curriculum is through the integrative core curriculum. Now, this is the same curriculum that our full-time MBA students take. Um, it is really kind of uh, the most distinct part and actually probably, uh, I would say, the pinnacle of the experience for many students because you're in a classroom of 75 students coming from all different industries and all different sectors, and you're having conversations through the stakeholder perspective yes. lens, which is very different from having more of a conversation around the functional practices in business. Um, so for example, um, you might have a class called the employee, which is really about strategic um, management of the workforce. And in doing so, you're learning not only HR practices, but internally there's messaging that takes place. And so with the messaging that you're doing from a marketing perspective and in combination with somebody who's coming from organizational behavior, to really create um, that perspective in a way so that you can really see through this lens when it comes to hiring practices, talent management, motivating your employees. Um, so then on the opposite end of that, you might have a class called the investor, which is looking for healthcare professionals. This is sometimes a very new area um, where you're looking at stocks and bonds and valuation, asset, asset allocation, um, and really taught some of the nuances with, within how investors think to make really strategic decisions when they're placing their money in different areas. Um, so all very interested all very interesting courses, um, but again, coming from the stakeholder perspective. So I wanted to ask you, Howie, how you see this curriculum um, really shaping healthcare leaders in particular. Right, so you know, I'm fortunate enough to, to teach undergraduates and graduate students at Yale, and so I'm very often asked the question about why an MBA over an MPH, why an MBA over a different degree. Mm -hmm. And I think my, my easiest answer to that is that there's almost no overlap between the curriculum that you've just described and on the slide now and the medical school curriculum. There's a lot of overlap between a public health curriculum and a medical school curriculum and so on. There's almost no overlap between these. So this is an incredibly expansive experience. It allows people to think and understand things in ways that they previ previously haven't. Uh, there is a vast literature uh, out there that even directly applies this to individual patient care even and decision making there, which is something that we don't do a particularly good job training our own students with. And I think this changes the way you think about that. Um, and I, it is, I can't overemphasize how much this empowers mm. our clinicians, our nurses, our physicians, our physician associates. Uh, we've even had, I think, a physical therapist through the program. We've really empowered these people in ways that even when we first dreamed of such a program, I don't think I really thought we would do as much as we've been able to do. Um, and as you've pointed out, each of these components has a, a direct impact on how how one interacts with the world, whether you are an investor or whether you need investors, whether you are somebody who's looking to manage people at work and manage change, which is so much a piece of what physicians have to do and, and very often are not trained to do well. Um, these are all the components that we give them. The operations engine, which is sort of an introductory uh, way of thinking about uh, operations improvement uh, is a stepping stone to our healthcare operations class. Uh, the, the customer um, and the competitor classes are, are incorporated into the healthcare finance delivery and economics class and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, I just can't uh, speak more strongly about why this year in particular, this core year, has such an enormous impact, even though when you talk to people, they'll very often say to me, tell me more about the healthcare curriculum. I think the healthcare curriculum is great and important, but nothing is more powerful than this. Yeah, thank you for that. I was having pizza um, with a few of our students. <laughs> um, I think it was in May and my mom was in town and they just, so somebody was from healthcare, um, sustainability and asset management just worked out that way. And you know, we, t we talk about the integrated core curriculum all the time, um, but without solicitation and in just casual conversation, um, each of them said that they were so impressed with the design of the curriculum and how it flows from one course to the next, and how even though they hear this message um, during their admissions process, once they're here, it, it takes them until the very end mm. to see kind of the orchestration of all of this in concert together. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a, 
wonderful to hear you speak to it the same way. So now we, you know, we move into the advanced management courses in the second year. And again, this is typically a part of what second years might take as electives during the full-time program. But because we're a highly structured program, we need to have some of these in place. So we have five courses, the five courses at the bottom that all students will take together. And then there are a couple of options. And we're finding that more and more students coming from healthcare perspectives are also very much interested in entrepreneurship and new ventures. Um, and then there's the option also for managerial controls or policy design. Um, but, but it's interesting to see how people choose and what they're most interested in. Um, and this is also running in tandem with the healthcare leadership courses. Um, so I'm going to skip over to the healthcare leadership courses. And then if you, Howie, at some point could talk to how these work in concert with those courses. Sure. And Marcel, I'm priming you to speak to your new class coming up. Um, so this is a picture of the healthcare conference. This is the largest student-run conference. Um, and it's led here at Yale. And I know Howie has served on the board and works with the students who organize this each year. I think we see over 400 participants. We've got 500. And, and, just, and just to point out, this is a picture of a breakout room. Yes. Oh, wow. That's a breakout room. I mean, that is not the conference. That's just one breakout session. <laughs> yeah, I mean, we've, we've been really fortunate. Um, the conference has existed for, I think, 13 years now. Uh, and the current, the last conference we ran in April had over 500 participants. Uh, we expect that number to expand. Uh, this coming year, we may even create a Thursday evening session that may have to do with health equity uh, and gender equity in healthcare. Um, and it's something that our EMBA students have become more immersed in over time. And in fact, I think there are three students in the current uh, cohort who are actively engaged with the student leaders of the healthcare conference to help them with content, uh, advice, um, mentorship, and so on. So we're very pleased that this is something that is from day one involved our EMBA students because it started around the same time that our EMBA students started. Uh, and has continued to, to grow with the help of our program. Yeah, and it's a phenomenal, having had an opportunity yeah. to participate in the conference, I think it's just a phenomenal um, opportunity and gathering a real feather in the cap here. It's yeah. great. Wow, thank you. So when's the date for this upcoming? I think it's April 13th. April 13th. I think it's either the 12th or the 13th. It's a Friday. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> So th this is the curriculum for the healthcare leadership component. And again, this happens in the second year. And this is one of the first times where you'll actually be segmented with primarily other healthcare professionals and away from your, your colleagues and from sustainability and asset management. And uh, Marcel, I know that you'll be teaching um, the population health and health equity. So I'm really curious to hear more about the course and yeah. about uh, the learning outcomes that you anticipate. Yeah, so um, so it's wonderful. You know, everything you've said, we have a chance here with this fellowship program to really layer on um, what is already a uh, uh, a fabulous platform of educational opportunity. And um, as you said, what we're introducing, we actually have our inaugural launch of the Population Health and Health Equity course coming up in a few weeks. Um, oh. Yes. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> Yay. Um, and I'm excited because I'm getting to, to work on developing that, uh, that, uh, that course with a recent graduate of the EMBA program, uh, Brad Richards, who is um, an internist and, and an amazing partner in this course design and development. Um, and so, you know, as is on the slide, this is a course that will be, um, uh, you know, available and, and will be taken by everyone in the healthcare, uh, healthcare track. Uh, and it's wonderful we have a chance now to be um, responsive in, in part to what's been student request over the years to begin to build out some of this content area. Um, it's what we're really hoping to accomplish across our, um, our sessions in this course is to provide um, the learners in the room uh, with several sort of constructs, um, definitional frameworks, but also um, models and examples of innovation in this space. And so we, um, are wonderfully fortunate to have uh, a, a really, I think, great lineup of guests who will come in and bring their real world experiences to, uh, to talk to us both about um, sort of uh, policy considerations, right? We're gonna uh, for sure be talking about value-based payments and care. Um, also spaces where there are startup tech innovations that have potential to address um, health 
and healthcare inequities, um, and and really uh, to allow the learners to share their experiences too. I mean, one of the advantages to this format is the learning doesn't happen just from the front of the classroom. And so everyone in the room is bringing uh, their own expertise into the conversation. And we're also going to leverage that and that co-learning atmosphere. Um, so we're, we're, um, we're so super excited <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> about this course. Uh, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. And just the planning has been fun. And I think speaks again to the great um, just atmosphere here to School of Management. I do want to take a, a moment and say that it's uh, been very welcoming. You know, I, I I don't know if we're going to talk about it directly, but you know, starting on this um, uh, this new journey for this fellowship program, I have to say that I have several colleagues who kind of held opinions about what kind of people um, yeah. are at schools of management, um, <laughs> and that those of us who work in social justice mm -hmm. as anchors and, and think a lot about healthcare and like, what are we doing at a school of management? Mm -hmm. uh, and so I have to admit myself sort of coming in with, um, I mean, I know Howie so long and so well, but sort of coming in with this, is there place mm -hmm. for people mm -hmm. who um, have goals similar to what, uh, what have steered me? Um, uh, are, are we welcome here? And so it's uh, like a resounding Yes. I mean, in fact, it um, uh, has surpassed expectation in terms of uh, just the welcoming for, uh, for, the, for the content, mm -hmm. for the fellowship program. Um, and, and, it's, and there's no better place, frankly, than Yale School of Management because there is already deep value alignment mm -hmm. um, ar around the things that we are really focusing on in the fellowship program. So we're excited about the course, um, but really excited to call the School of Management home for the fellowship program. It's going to be... It's going to be great. Thank you so much for speaking about inclusion. Yes, that's, absolutely. That's so important that people feel welcome and yes. yeah, and the whole way through. So yes. thank you so much. Yeah, and so Howie, this is kind of a segue to speaking about other faculty. We've had yep. the honor of hearing Marcella speak about our class. Can you speak for the other faculty and the program and the courses? Sure, I'll just point out that um, we began this. So what Marcella said is true. We have had a request for a class like this for several years. Mm -hmm. Finding the right person to teach a class like this and then being able to convince that person to come over here and teach it <laughs> is not always the easiest thing. So we, we basically uh, engaged Marcella in launching this class way before we got the yes. fellowship. Yeah. Uh, so we committed to this class not because of the fellowship, we committed to this class because we needed it for a long time and we finally had her in the building and could show her <laughs> and explain why this would be such yeah. a great thing. Um, so we couldn't be more pleased about it. I'm personally very excited about it uh, because it really does round out the offerings that we have. Uh, there's probably, you know, it's probably impossible to figure out what is the perfect curriculum like for any program, but if there could be a perfect curriculum, I like to think this is it. Um, it's sort of listed. I'll, I'll just change the way it's ordered because my class, which is listed in the middle, the healthcare policy and finance class, is really a survey class that begins in the summer. And so it takes our students in a transition from the core into the drill down courses. Uh, so they take my class six days in a row in the summer, which uh, you know always seems daunting to me before I do it. And then while I'm doing it, it's a little exhausting, but then it's very exhilarating to actually engage and get to know the students so well at that time. And then they move into the second year, the full second year, and that's when they take all the, la the other classes. The advanced health economics class is really a, um, it's part two, or it's the second level of what I'm teaching. I'm teaching a very superficial explanation of health economics. Um, Jason Abelock teaches a much more advanced level. Our global health class is taught by a global health expert who is a pediatric infectious disease specialist in the medical school, Elijah Pinsel. Um, our healthcare operations class is taught by the deputy dean of the School of Management, uh, and this has been his passion for his entire career. So it's not somebody who comes from the outside and just has to try to teach something. It's somebody who's teaching their core, you know, the substance of what they've made their scholarly and teaching career about. 
managing and innovating healthcare organizations is taught by Greg Lickelai, who is a serial entrepreneur and a very successful uh, business person who works right now as a chief uh, medical information officer for a contract research organization, but previously had worked for McKinsey and had brought two companies public and done a lot of other really great things in his career, in addition to just incidentally being a neurosurgeon by training uh, and having a, a business degree from a competing business school. <laughs> um, and then you've already heard about Marcella's class. And, you know, we feel like, you know, if I go back 10 years, I would say, where were we deficient? We were deficient in uh, data uh, and data analysis. We were deficient in global health. Those were our two biggest holes. Everything else we sort of had covered one way or the other. And we filled in the global health hole probably six or seven years ago now. And now with Marcella, I feel like we have the complete package of at least what the students are asking for. Uh, and we're, we're, you know, we are dynamic and we will continue to respond to change. And if the students ask us something else or ask us to modify courses, we'll continue to do that as well. Thank you. It is really important that we're listening to the students yes. and what they're saying. I think they're in the field and they're you know, hearing what some of the challenges are and wish to kind of fill those gaps where they can with new knowledge. And um, I know, Howie, um, I'm skipping ahead a little bit, but you really do a lot for the students as faculty director and you host lunchtime chats um, on occasion. So I think this is just one way in which you're able to keep the students are basically asking for more information. Can you share a little bit more about what those lunchtime chats Yeah, so are? that started because the students asked for it. We had a couple of them that were informal a few years ago, and then it became more formal, and we now have it on the schedule. Uh, a few weeks ago, they said that uh, they had had a lecture. The second-year students had had a lecture from Fiona Scott Morton, who's one of our rock star health econ economists who works in the healthcare field. Um, and they just you know, loved her and they couldn't get enough. And they said, can we invite her? I said, we can definitely invite her. You know, it's hard to know whether she's available or not. And she was very, very kind and immediately opted in, came to it, and we had a one-hour dialogue about drug pricing and drug competition and generic competition and so on, which is a very timely topic. There are very few people that could talk about it from a scholarly point of view. Uh, she's someone who's also worked in the antitrust division of the Department of Justice. So she brings um, you know, a public policy point of view as well. And to be able to bring that person into the room for an informal chat, not even one of our formal sessions, was fantastic. And, and also shows me why we're so proud of our faculty who are willing to step up when we need them or want them. Absolutely. Thank you. So in skipping ahead, um, also thinking about people who are coming into the classroom uh, for the colloquium, um, you have, I mean, I've witnessed your network and all of your connections, including this one. Um, so, you know, this is really, you know, you create the colloquium speakers, you set the agenda for us. So can you tell us a little bit about um, perhaps the three that you've added here, but also maybe others that you're excited to bring in? Yeah, so we're, we're constantly, we're on a two-year sort of cycle. So uh, it's, I try never to have the same speaker two years in a row, and very often it does turn into three years, but we're in a sort of two-year cycle. So we try to hit all sectors of the healthcare economy, including public sector, including private sector actors, including uh, people with geographic diversity, occasional global health speakers as well. The three speakers you have um, on the screen right now, Tom Scully was the uh, head of Medicare in the second Bush administration. A um, man who, you know, describes himself and other people describe as a pathological truth teller uh, <laughs> because he really does speak the truth, even though he has served primarily in Republican administrations. Uh, Mandy Cohen is the Secretary of Health and Human Services for North Carolina after serving in the Obama administration for several years. Um, and we're, you know, proud of as a graduate of our medical school here uh, not too long ago. Um, and then Sachin Jain, who I've had the fortune of knowing for about eight or nine years right now and who I've watched his career, even though he's never been to Yale other than visiting us, um, is the CEO of what I think is one of the more dynamic and innovative uh, healthcare companies, a division of Anthem called Caremore, uh, which has a presence in this state and has a presence in Texas and, and many other states, but has its primary home in California. And um, uh, Sachin, I think, is a, you know, a leading visionary in healthcare right now from the private sector side. Um, and so bringing these people into the classroom, allowing them to engage with our students, uh, allowing them to become part of the network of our students. Uh, we have students that have 
gone to Tom Scully, to Mandy Cohn, and Sachin Jain for numerous conversations, connections, and occasionally internships and jobs. So, uh, you know, nothing could make us happier than to see those connections, you know, thriving and growing. Excellent. And so when we're thinking about leadership in minority health care, um, who are you excited to bring in or who are, where are your thoughts around having speakers? I, th I think that is part of the practice. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I'll just start off by saying that we've always paid attention to the sector. We've had uh, speakers that either they themselves uh, come from uh, underrepresented groups and people of color. We've also uh, had people specifically addressing the needs of uh, minority health groups. Um, and we've, I think we've been very successful at being able to do that. What we're hoping to be able to do for the Commonwealth Fund Fellows uh, is to be able to have additional speakers coming in, perhaps on a Thursday evening occasionally, in addition to our current speakers that would speak to our Commonwealth Fund Fellows. Yeah, and I just want to echo the point you made first, Howie, because I've um, been very grateful to be um, in attendance at many of these colloquia um, and to say I actually don't think talking about health equity will be as a new yeah. uh, part of this. That is, you know, typically I think where a lot of the conversation goes and discussion. Um, and so I think that this this is a, a real part where um, it's going to be expanding on already what I think has been a really a robust focus on disparity populations um, and health equity in the colloquium. So we are excited to bring in more speakers and additional speakers. Mm -hmm. And I've already started emailing. Um, yeah. So surprise, <laughs> surprise, surprise. surprise. But we, yeah, we're very excited to be able to to bring in um, even even more, and and most certainly um, not just for the fellows. Uh, but for for everyone in the in the larger community who's interested in participating in those, and I've benefited from that over the years myself. So thank you. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> All right, so let's see. Now we have, um, I think this is the part of the practicum, um, sorry, where it was the component over the two years. So this is something that you would do in your second year, but I believe the mentorship and the field immersions happen at different times. So I'm really curious to hear from you, Marcella, about the mentorship program and how, how that will work with, with Commonwealth Fellows. Yeah, so I think there, there are a couple values that are anchoring us in the mm -hmm. fellowship program. One is really um, around building community, mm -hmm. Uh, which we'll talk about more, I think, particularly with the immersion, and we talked about some just now with the colloquium. I'm very impressed by, you know, it's an executive format, and so you could imagine that um, without attention, mm -hmm. you won't have a sense of community. Uh, but mm -hmm. once again, kudos to, uh, to the School of Management, because there has been a lot of attention paid to that, and we are thinking um, about that again with the fellowship program and community. I think the other is expanding knowledge networks. Um, and so we want to really make sure that someone coming through this program, you know, if they do their own social network map, that upon exit, we'll be able to say, I've really grown my knowledge network and my connections. And one of the ways to do that is through structured um, mentorship. And so we um, are, are Again, wonderfully grateful to colleagues and friends and others in our networks who have already sort of stepped mm -hmm. up and committed to serving um, as mentors. And we have an entire um, sort of mentor academy, you know, people wow. who are local um, and regional and people who are national. And, uh, and we will have, we, I, we don't need to sort of get to um, bot on the details, mm -hmm. but because we have a national advisory mm -hmm. um, committee and we have institutional um, advisors as well, it, th there really are um, a lot of opportunities for quite tailored, quite dedicated mentoring. And in addition to, uh, to that mentoring network, you know, Howie and I are, of course, mm -hmm. going to be available to all of the fellows um, as advisors and, and mentors and long-term colleagues. Yeah. Right. That's wonderful. Yeah, I would just add that, um, you know, we've been very successful for decades at Yale in being able to foster this network of healthcare leadership. Um, and uh, when I've reached out to people, and Marcel and I have both reached out to people telling them about this as, it, as we realized we were going to get the award and wanted to hear their thoughts on it, every one of them is so enthusiastic. There is such 
you know, I, I imagine that there are 10 mentors available for every one yes. of the fellows wow. because there's so many people that just want to be in, yeah. involved in this program. I, I told Marcella last week that even one of our faculty members in the School of Public Health sort of came up to me um, at, at a function that we were at and said, you know, I heard you got this. We got to talk. I really want to help. Yes. Everybody wants to help, and everybody has a way that they can help uniquely, and we're going to tap into that. Yes. Yeah. There are so many expansive like resources and opportunities, not only for students, but for everybody through the networks. Yes. Um, and it is, again, just echoing on the idea of like inclusion and bringing people in. Like That is really the art of creating community in so yeah. many ways. Yeah. Most certainly. Yeah. And so can you tell us a little bit more about the practicum and the field immersive experience? Yeah, so when we started the program, we realized that in this way back, we had no electives. And the students in the first year complained to us about no electives. And so we created one elective. Right? <laughs> right. And so that was our initial foray. And, and you all, as the program has evolved in the last few years, and the leadership of, of Sylvia and David has helped us develop a little more flexibility in the curriculum. But one thing that has stayed in there is this sort of independent study slot. Um, and that has been used by our students for a host of activities. Nothing is more uh, satisfying than when someone uses that to do a project, either alone or in a team. Um, and doing a project, you remember, every one of our students is full-time employed. Yes. Every one of them is probably or you know, continues to be an active clinician. If they're not an active clinician, they were a clinician, and they're probably involved with clinicians. And so... It's very, it's very exciting to have this new skill set. And you also see all these new projects that you can do. And what we do with this course is, number one, give you the latitude to take on a project that you might otherwise not have had time for, provide mentorship here, hopefully provide mentorship at your home institution, and, and give you the guidance to see a project to fruition over that second year. Ideally, that project would be directly in the minority health policy space. Um, but I think that we're open to other ideas in the health equity realm, uh, talking about you know, how you can use your new skills to deliver on that promise. And, and that we believe that will be a substantive and formative experience for every one of our fellows. Yeah. And only to piggyback and say that I have the you know, opportunity now to be serving as a faculty mentor to a current uh, second year um, yeah, in, oh, the that's e right. yeah, yeah. in the EMBA that's program, right. which is Right. right. I mean, only to say, again, that um, because of uh, when um, when people come and do the EMBA in their career trajectory, people are already bringing quite mm -hmm. a, a deep right. sort of tool kit. And so um, for, for this practicum, which is, you know, again, it's squarely in the health equity minority health mm -hmm. space. So to underscore again that this isn't, you know, this isn't all about new, right? We've right. already doing this, right. um, but even talking to my colleagues, because he's helping with some system transformation work at the School of Medicine, mm -hmm. and talking with others and senior leadership, you know, it's to, to frame it and say, you don't understand, like, we're getting through this practicum, um, what we really would pay a consultant right. many tens of thousands right. of dollars to so do. Right. And so this is a gift. I mean, the first reaction was sort of like, oh, it's a student project. And I was like, let's reframe. Right. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, again, these the, the, the learners who are coming in um, through the EMBA and again through the, the, uh, the Commonwealth um, Fellowship, uh, you know, are bringing expertise mm -hmm. and bringing that to bear. And so... We are, you know, we are benefiting. These, the, the practicum um, experience is not something that's like a classroom or a report. Right. I mean, this is resulting in real world change and application. We are so excited to be working with this student now um, on this work and with the fellows moving forward. That's really exciting. Yeah. That's Very like, exciting. yeah, especially when you can see the tan the, the the ability to impact yes. something at Yale New Haven immediately yeah. through a project. You know, or wherever, because or wherever. the practicum you know, wouldn't necessarily have to be here at Yale, but absolutely, I think that's a real plus. Yeah. Good, thank you. I know that we're getting close to time, so I might speed through here a little bit, but would you have anything to say about the field immersive, immersion. immersion experience? So um, we have... We have uh, done trips, in fact, Marcel and I have a nice picture from 2007 uh, or five, I think, mm -hmm. I think it was five, five. Uh, when we did a trip from the Robert Johnson Clinical Scholars Program to Washington. It is our intention to be able to do two trips a year 
uh, um, two trips for each fellowship class. One will probably be a DC trip, one will probably be a local trip to a, uh, a city or, or a, a region of the country um, and try to learn from officials on the ground there. And so as an example, Mandy Cohen listed mm -hmm. for North Carolina would be an excellent opportunity for us to learn from both government as well as private entities in that region. Uh, we could reach out, I, I, I can imagine almost any of the top 25 cities in the country, we have enough context and that we can learn from them. And on a DC trip, hopefully again, also learn from our uh, elected representatives as well as from appointed individuals working in the healthcare uh, sphere, and then all of the stakeholders that work within Washington and lobby and advocate and so on. So we have experience with doing this. It's very exciting, it's very exhausting, um, but uh, we're looking forward to it. Yeah, good, thank you. And so I feel, um, I, I know that we're one minute to time, but if you all who are in the audience watching, if you don't mind, we're going to spend a few more minutes. And is that okay for both sure. of you as well? Yeah, okay. Um, so I'm going to go over quickly just really what this format looks like um, for very busy professionals. Um, it's a 22-month program where classes are held every other Friday, Saturday. There are four weeks in residence. Some of those will be the field immersive experience, but we also have two weeks at the start of every year with an orientation to management, which is really where you get to meet all of your classmates and your colleagues and meet all the faculty and staff um, and take four classes that will set you up and give you the foundational skills you need to start with the integrated core curriculum. Um, and then you'll have another week-long immersion um, in the, I guess, the start of your second year. Um, and then classes usually end the end of May. And so, you know, in 22 months, you will have finished uh, the full MBA program. Um, so this is a sample class weekend where you'll take four classes each weekend, and we also have some opportunities that are our amazing uh, program, academic program team puts together for our students. So you'll have cross-campus events. We went to Cushing Medical Library last time um, and saw the well contained brains. brains. <laughs> um, and then we'll do optional workshops, which are really meant to provide some more professional and personal development. So we've had people like uh, uh, Professor Grace Sandarsky come and lead uh, mm -hmm. a workshop on executive voice and presence. Um, and uh, Mark Brackett from the Center of Emotional for Intel Intelligence come and lead a conversation about innovation through emotional intelligence. All very interesting. So I'm always surprised that many of our students, no matter where they live, they stay the extra two hours to participate in some of these events. Um, so we are located here in New Haven, which is really just a couple of hours away from Boston and New York and a nice train ride away from DC. But we have students coming from all over the US, about 10 to 15 percent of our students are coming from further away than the Mississippi. Mm -hmm. um, so, and we have uh, three international students in our more recent class, meaning they're traveling from Mexico, they're traveling from Canada, and I believe, where is the Ellen traveling from? Well, uh, Shanghai, we, had, Shanghai, yeah, Shanghai, yeah, we've had that. Yeah. Shanghai and Guatemala and right. Norway, Germany, yeah. So people really um, take the time and effort to, to get right. here. Let's see. So this is um, the extended classroom is something that we put together a couple of years ago. As you can see, we're in the state of art classroom with yes. excellent technology, and so on occasion our students can zoom in to their classes. This is usually, um, there are some policies around this, so only eight students per any class weekend because the bulk of the curriculum is really meant to be shared um, with your classmates and with the professor, but on occasion. So for example, um, during the Hurricane Harvey in Texas, um, you know, some of our students were able to zoom in there. Um, on other occasions, people have weddings or events to go to that if they're able to stay home that weekend and, and be present fully online, then they can also manage to attend family events. We rarely tap out at the at the upper oh. limit of what we're doing, right? I mean, we typically only have a couple of people zooming in. Absolutely, yeah. We rarely tap out, unless there's like uh, inclement weather right. or something right. like that. Yeah. Um, so along with that, I wanted to share some other profiles of the larger class. So we have um, the class of 17, Jamila Abstin. She was traveling from Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I think mid-second year, she was recruited by EY to partner. Um, she has been an amazing advocate of the program and has recently won the Donaldson Leadership Award mm -hmm. for oh, alumni. Um, just Yeah, I think that was last year. And then Timothy Memmi, a recent graduate, he um, is coming from consumer goods and in the practice of sustainability, was really curious to hear how 
the mindset is shifting towards sustainability, even in the spirits industry. Um, so he's um, actively seeking ways to market and brand differently. And then, of course, um, not not least, um, Shashank <laughs> Ravi, who is a physician and a fellow at Yale Med School of Medicine. Um, he is a part of the Emergency Medicine Fellowship Program and is maybe one of the people that might be doing an independent project or the yes. practicum right now. So he is. Yeah, excellent. Um, so I think most people are really curious about eligibility. And so, you know, part of what we'd like to hear, um, I, we're looking for clinicians who have had um, developed practices in serving vulnerable population with at least five years of postgraduate um, experience. But I wanted to hear from both of you about who are we excited to recruit and what, you know, what do we hope the fellows look like in terms of their profile? Mm -hmm. Yeah, do you want to start? I would just say that we're, we're looking for people who have demonstrated interest and already show emerging leadership in the field of health equity, mm -hmm. in the field of minority health policy. Um, and we're looking for atypical candidates as well. Uh, we, we would love to find somebody who's a medical director for a city or state mm -hmm. who hasn't had the experience of doing a program like this. So uh, that was, I'll just start with that. Yeah. And, no, I mean, I echo what both of you have said. And I think, you know, we are really looking for the person for whom this experience would be transformative in their career. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and so, uh, you know, that person who is kind of late early, um, an early mid career, and really this is going to make all the difference mm -hmm. in terms of what their sphere of influence can be moving sure. forward. Um, and that's who we're looking for. And, and only to say, because, you know, practice has so many meanings for the mm -hmm. clinicians, but when we talk about who's, you know, whose practice has already shown a track record, this can be through your scholarly activity. Right. It doesn't have to mm -hmm. necessarily be through your clinical work, sure. but certainly um, we are looking for, for that person who has long had as an anchor in their career, thinking about minority health, um, and are, are on a path to my, further minority health leadership. Okay, thank you so much yeah. for that clarity. Yeah, no, we're getting a lot of questions, a lot of interest yeah. about this, and so That's having great. that clarity right. is fantastic. And so this is really about next steps. Um, so really, you know, you can find us online. We do a pre-assessment review. I'm happy to review your profile along with my colleagues. I'm happy to share those profiles with either of you. Mm -hmm. And we're also happy to host you um, on campus for an information session. Our next one will be October 27th, and then the following will be November 10th. You can sign up online for those. And if you are out of region and you want to chat, um, simply, you know, give us a call, connect with us. We're happy we're happy to share as much as we can with you beyond what we've shared today. Um, and then in terms of the application deadlines and admissions, our first deadline will be November 13th, and second will be January 29th. Uh, one of the questions we have is whether or not um, this will be, uh, a, is there a time stamp? Like, can you only apply to the first round? And so we are asking for the bulk of our applications to come through in the first round, but this will be a rolling admission. So you can apply at any other date. Yeah. And I think it's fair to say that we want to begin a conversation with people. And so we're happy to engage with you now because you want to apply a year from now or even yes, two years absolutely. from now. So we're, we're not just looking to fill the class right now. But the best advice that I think we can give people who want to apply for this coming year is to get your applications in early because we've witnessed already a lot of people with interest. Uh, and we believe that we probably would fill those slots in the first yeah. round. Thank you. Exactly. Thanks so much. Um, and so if you want any information about any of the components to the application, please feel free to reach out to us. I'm going to leave this up so you can reach us at emba.admissions at Yale. Um, I want to thank both of you so much for being here and sharing more about the wonderful work that's happening not only at Yale Medicine, Yale School mm -hmm. of Medicine, but also Yale School of Management and this collaboration with the Commonwealth Fund. Thanks, Maria. Yeah, yeah thank you so much, yeah. Maria. Thanks, Marcella, for being here. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, we're very happy. And we're ditto very excited. <laughs> There's a lot of love fest Yes, no. I <laughs> I think that's what we want to do. <laughs> yes. Thank you all for joining us. Um, thanks to my colleague, David Daniel, who's been fielding questions. We'll get to those via email. And if you need anything else, please feel free to reach out to us. We're more than happy to connect. Um, have a wonderful afternoon, and thank you so much.